So turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 10. We'll be reading from verses 17 through verse 31. This is the story of the rich young ruler. So as Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. And looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But at these words he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, With people it is impossible but not with God, for all things are possible with God. And Peter began to say to him, Behold, we've left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there was no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Father in heaven, we're here to know your salvation and to make it known to others and to reflect who you are. Father, we pray that this would not just be something that we see as part of what we do, but so central that we would be your people, that we would reflect your glory, that we'd be more like your son, and that we'd be a testimony to the world. So bless us now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So you're sitting on the airplane, and there's a person next to you, and you're having a conversation, and you, you know the tension that you might feel if you're a believer that's like, okay, I, I need to share my faith with this person, and you're chatting around, and, and this person actually notices that you have a Bible, and he starts asking you all sorts of questions, and he's very interested, and then he just comes right and asks you, what do I have to do to be saved? Now, that doesn't happen too often, but you feel, what, what an opportunity. Here's a softball that say, what must I do to be saved? And what would the answer be that you give? Now, if you've taken some of those contemporary evangelism classes, you've been taught that the answer is, well, you don't need to do anything. You do nothing. It, Romans 6.23, you quote him, says that the, the free gift of God is eternal life. And you tell them that they just have to receive the gift. So you tell them to, to, to pray a prayer and thank God for the gift and... and then go read your Bible and get involved in a healthy church, and, and, and the deal's done. Now, of course, Romans 6.23 is very true, but Jesus didn't take the same course that you might have taken, and he doesn't quite use the same script, and he doesn't deal with every person in the same way. Last week, we actually looked at one of Jesus' answers about how one has to be saved, and Jesus taught his disciples, you have to become like a, a little child to be saved. You need to come completely needy and dependent and helpless with, with no claims or, or no merit on your own to commend yourself to God. And this week, we see another answer, which is really another way of getting at the same point last week. We, we see it in an encounter that Jesus has with a man who comes to him and asks him this question about how to, how to inherit eternal life. 
how do I get to heaven? The passage talks in verses 23, 24, and 25 about the kingdom of God. The disciples ask about who can be saved. All talking about the same thing. Who gets to heaven? Salvation. And Jesus' answer to this man isn't according to the class. He says, go, sell all you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasures in heaven. For this man to be saved, Jesus calls him to get rid of all his things. Now, what do we do when we go to this passage? We can ask ourselves, yeah, do I have to sell all to be saved? But usually we basically have a few ways of saying, no, we don't. One answer, of course, is, well, I'm not rich. This passage might be for rich people who really have an idolatry problem with with wealth, and they need to get rid of it, but it doesn't apply to me. Now, of course, when someone says I'm not rich, it might it might mean that they really live hand to mouth day by day. Or it just might mean that there's other people that are richer than them. And the passage is always for them and money's a stumbling block for them, but it's not for me. Maybe, maybe not. Of course, another answer might be you really are rich. And you know you're rich, and if you live in this country, we are pretty rich, but you might be really, really rich. But what we do is we jump right down to the verse 27 where it says, well, all things are possible with God. He can save rich people. And yes, I've believed some facts about Jesus, and I prayed the prayer, and I'm okay, and I don't really need to worry about this passage, and I can keep my riches. Well, it could be. But it also could be that you're kidding yourself. And, and unless you've literally given up all that you have for Christ, you probably need to make sure about what this warning means that Jesus has. And, and also, that you're not in the warning like Mark gives in chapter 4, where Jesus actually he tells the parable of the soils. You remember that one where there's a, a sower who goes out to sow the seed, which is the word of God, and there's some of that seed that lands in soil with thorns in it. And those thorns, they, they choke out the, the, the plant that grows from the seed. It chokes out the word and then becomes unfruitful. And the thorns are interpreted as the deceitfulness of riches, the cares of the world, the desires for other things. Yes, there might have been a seed and there's a little sprout there. You've agreed to some truths, but you don't bear the fruit of discipleship. It doesn't seem... Like, like your living is one who's truly saved. Instead, you might be like what Paul warned about in 1 Timothy 6, where in your pride, you're really placing your hope in the uncertainty of riches and not in God. So before we say, I don't have to sell all that I have, we, we need to learn what this passage is really saying. And I, I think it has something to teach all of us. And, and, and the first thing I think we have to understand is repentance is necessary for salvation. You can't hold on to any substitute God as your ultimate allegiance, whether it's wealth or or status or reputation, career, family, anything, and still be saved. And the other point that this passage really drives home is that salvation is impossible on your own. You have to be completely dependent upon God for, for doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. We have to be like a little child continuing from last week. So so that's where we're going. And and until we understand these aspects, we're going to miss a major understanding in in our evangelism, in our outward testimony when we answer people who ask, and perhaps we're going to even lead others to be deceived or we even might be deceived ourselves thinking we have what we don't. But if we do understand, there is a comfort and hope in the grace of God and the promises of God and the fellowship with him that can enable us to surrender all like nothing else could. So as we go into this passage, let's let's first kind of develop what Jesus is giving us about the necessity of, of repentance for salvation. So Mark begins telling us, verse 17, of this man running up to ask Jesus a question. And at first, Mark doesn't even tell us anything about the man except how he came. It says he's he's running and kneeling before him. You have a sense of he has something important that he wants to ask to Jesus. 
He, he must have heard somehow that, that Jesus was passing through and he had heard of his reputation and he ran eagerly to catch him before he was gone. And when he gets to Jesus, he's, he's got this total respect, he, even kneeling at, as if one to petition someone in authority. And Mark doesn't tell us right away what Luke tells us right up front, that this man is a ruler in the parallel account. He says that this man is a ruler. He probably had some kind of authority of his own, either in the synagogue probably or, or the Sanhedrin, which is the local council in all the towns that, that made rulings on religious matters. So, so he's a ruler. And Matthew adds something else that says that he was young. And all three of the accounts tell us that this man was a rich man. So this is why the story is called the story of the rich young ruler, putting all those together. And of course, that's not all we learn. Morally, this is, this is an upright guy. He, he's kept all the laws, he says. He's honored his parents. He didn't get rich by swindling people. And the question he asks is probably one of the most profound questions we see anywhere in the scriptures. That this man... Seems like he's ready to hear truth. And, and, and at a human level, he's got all the right stuff. He has everything that people measure status by. He, he's blessed by God with this, these riches. He's, he, he, he's, he knows right from wrong. He's religiously active. He cares about spiritual things. He's well looked upon by others. And, and he comes with such an intensity and he seems so sincere and he, he shows, he shows a humility and a vulnerability. It's not typical for a guy with this kind of status and wealth to go running up to anybody or let alone kneeling to them. And he admits that, I need some guidance here. Teacher, tell me. So what kind of tactics might you use with a person like this? This ideal witnessing candidate. It's not like some of the people that you witness to and they get hung up on, where did Cain get his wife? Or... How can you be sure God exists and all these other things here? He's already there. He believes in the one God, and he probably knows his Bible better than most. He's probably like most people who've had a Christian upbringing and and still affirm a a basic belief in God and in the Bible, and he probably believes in heaven and probably thinks that he's going there. So look what Jesus says to him. How, how How does Jesus handle him? Well, right away, he doesn't even respond with the typical greetings. He actually kind of, kind of reproves the guy. He challenges him right from the outset. Verse 18 is like, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. Isn't that kind of, kind of in your face type of response? And what Jesus seems like he's doing here, he, he, he's forcing the man to consider what is good. What is the standard of goodness? Now, he probably thinks, at this point, I mean, he calls Jesus a teacher. He doesn't understand that he's divine. And he probably thinks that Jesus, he's, he's an exceptionally good man. But if you asked him, he would probably say that he's a good man too. You have one good man seeking to learn from a, another good man. What else is needed for eternal life? And, and this, this little goodness part here that Jesus said might seem like a side issue, but at the core, this man doesn't have his goodness scale quite right. And it's really important. When someone, in the context of talking about who goes to heaven, when someone throws around this term good so willy-nilly, what, what he's really doing has a couple errors. He's basically diminishing God and elevating man, elevating himself. And whenever unbelievers, even religious unbelievers like this, when, when they think about, about God, they usually have a conception that is less than what he really is. I mean, we all have some conception that's less than him, but they, they really have a conception that, that sees him a little closer to where they are at. And the result is it, it leaves us thinking that, you know, we aren't so bad. You can go around and ask people the, the good person test, right? Yeah, and yeah, I'm a good person. But when Jesus says God, he means the sovereign creator 
who's the ultimate goodness, the ultimate in holiness, the ultimate in justice. This is the God, because he is so good, can by no means ignore the sin that is around him. He cannot just wink at it. He is the standard of all goodness, and God alone is good. That's what Jesus says. It, it, it's helpful to know what's going on here when, when we think about how Jesus evangelizes, how, how he starts his response. You see what he's doing? He's starting with the character of God. That's how he's starting his evangelism. You want to know something about eternal life, you need to start with who God is. And you have a faulty, superficial concept of God and his goodness, then you're not going to understand the nature of the good news. And that's this man's basic problem. And it's man's basic problem in general, isn't it? They don't understand God. They don't understand what real goodness is. And all the sincerity, all the eagerness isn't going to do any good until they understand something about just how good God is. And with that, how short we fall in goodness. We know those types of deceptions, right? You, you can sincerely think that you're healthy, but if inside you you have cancer eating away your insides, it doesn't matter how sincere you are about believing that you're good. You, you need to deal with your true condition or you will die. So by pointing out to this man, the standard of goodness, Jesus is, is indirectly pointing out something about the man's condition. He is not good. And, and he's going to flush it out some more. He, he's going to expose the man's heart. And he kind of sets him up a little bit. In verse 19, he, he, he lays out some of the Ten Commandments. He says, you know the commandment. Don't, don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. And, and, and don't defraud, and he doesn't say don't covet, but defraud is, that, that's what you do. You swindle someone when you covet something to get it. And, and then he says, honor your father and mother. And the man responds, and, and we don't really know if he's disappointed because this is nothing new or because he's pleased because he senses he's on the right track. But he says, teacher, I've kept all these things from my youth up. Now we might say, yeah, right, but at one level... He's probably speaking the truth. If you look at how these commands are all written here, they can all refer to surface acts. I mean, he probably hasn't killed anyone. He really probably hasn't committed adultery with anyone. He didn't get his riches by swindling, and he honored his father and mother. He did fine on how he treated them externally. And if that's how you understand the commands, one could keep them, right? At that level, this man's basically what, what Paul would have said of himself before his salvation in Philippians 3, 6, that, that as far as the righteousness that comes from the law, I was blameless. See, this man, he probably wasn't at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount where Jesus taught about heart-level issues. He says, you've heard it said that you shall not commit murder. But I say, if you're angry, you're guilty. Or, you've heard it said that you shouldn't commit adultery. But I say to you, if you lust in your heart, you are guilty of these things. And so he didn't really get God's requirement for goodness that extended to the heart and not just external actions. And, and you got to know that when, whenever someone says that they, they keep the law or that they're a good person, you can be sure that they're talking about some watered-down version of the commandments, some externals, or, or they're just plain clueless, right? And Jesus could have easily challenged the man on his answer, couldn't he have? He could have gone into the Sermon on the Mount again, but he doesn't. He doesn't even disagree with the man. See, Jesus has a more fundamental point to make than just about a sin here and there. there. There's something more going on. We all have something more going on than just sin here and there. And, and, and Jesus is going to help this man uncover it. And, and he's, he's going to get to the man's chief problem. And I think this is just fascinatingly wise and, and a penetrating way of how he diagnoses what's going on in the man's heart and, and how 
short this man falls. The man says he kept all the commandments, right? But notice that Jesus only gave those of the Ten Commandments which dealt with other people, with, with what we say the horizontal relationships with others. He didn't mention any of the commands dealing with God, the, the vertical ones. And, of course, the first commandment is what? You shall have no other gods before me. No other gods. If you want to say that you keep the commandments, you need to have God as your God and, and nothing else. No other gods, not possessions, not wealth, not relationships, nothing can be your ultimate allegiance. So, and, and without ever quoting the first commandment, Jesus is going to press the man on just that. Well, watch how Jesus is exposed to him. He, he says in verse 21, he says, one thing you lack. And, and immediately here when it talks about lack, the man, the man isn't good to go. He, he's not okay. Eternal life does not belong to him. He is lacking. And, and, and Jesus, it's interesting because he doesn't specifically say what the one thing is. But he gives them four commands, four directives. He says, go and sell all you possess, give to the poor, and you'll have treasures in heaven, and come follow me. So he's got go, sell, give, and follow. Those are the four imperatives, the four commands. And the first three are all about removing something, removing his wealth. And the last one is about accepting something, really accepting someone. Accepting Christ. Follow me. Re- removing and accepting. Or, or perhaps in more familiar terms, repentance and faith. Two sides of the same coin. A, a repentance, a turning away from something. that Something which keeps you from God. And, and faith, a turning to God and belief and trust and allegiance. And, and they, they always go hand in hand if we have a biblical understanding of faith. That the faith that grabs hold of God has to let go of whatever else was God. And the repentance needed for this man was clear to Jesus. His wealth had taken the place of God. And he had to get rid of it. No one's going to have the kingdom of God if he has something else as his king. There's only one king in the kingdom. And yes, we can say that for everyone it's not riches, and you don't necessarily have to sell your riches. The woman at the well, she wasn't told to sell all that she had, right? She was challenged on the relationships that she had and the kind of worship she had. And she needed to remove her idol too in repentance and faith and and turn to the Lord. It's not a one-size-fits-all type of salvation. Jesus knows what uniquely stands in this man's way before he can become a disciple. For him, it's riches. And Jesus didn't say, get rid of 10% of what you have, but give all of what you have. Because you know what? Getting rid of 10% of what he had could have left the rest still as his God, couldn't it have? One can obey all the commandments that, that suit me and never really give myself over to God. We call that polishing idols. We just clean ourselves up. We get rid of all the, the little sins, but we never never touch the one which is our ultimate allegiance. You just deal with the superficial issues. And if we surrender everything except the one area of life that is the most important, which defines who we are, we haven't surrendered to him. Elsewhere, Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters. You can't have both wealth and God as masters. You you can have both, but they won't both be masters. This man's God, where where he finds his identity and security, is his possession. He's just demolishing the first commandment. And and, and Jesus is, is calling him in this moment to tear down, to smash his substitute God, to, to have his view of life revolutionized, to, to turn away from the idol of his soul and to become vulnerable like a child. But he wouldn't do it. Verse 22, he was unwilling to repent. 
He didn't want eternal life on Jesus' terms. He, he affirmed something about Jesus, that he was good, that he was a teacher. And we can acknowledge that Jesus is a good teacher, but still be lost. And at Jesus' words, he was saddened. And he went away grieving because he was one who owned much property. He was moved by sorrow. And by the way, Sorrow is not necessarily a sign of repentance. He was just sorrowful that he couldn't have both. And he was sorrowful because the reason is many possessions, because that's where his trust was. And because his trust was there, he, he couldn't put it somewhere else. And his idolatry is exposed. What's our idolatry? What was our idolatry before we came to the Lord? I'm not saying we don't struggle with it. Are we willing to let the Lord speak into it? Are we willing to come like a child and say, Lord, I believe, but help me in my unbelief like we saw a few weeks ago? What was lacking in this man was not something to add to do to what he's done already, but he needed to have a foundation added which drove everything that he did. Namely, he needed faith in Christ. And that's the flip side of repentance. Faith is, is what he needs to turn to and, and continue to turn to. And, and Jesus says, follow me. And if you think about it, this is a radical statement in this context because Jesus is putting himself at the center of the call of faith. He's basically saying eternal life depends on your response to me. It's it's not just turning from sin. It's just not it's not just wanting streets of gold. It's it's me. Jesus says, "Follow me. Learn from me. Imitate me. Obey me. Don't just call me teacher. Believe that I'm your teacher and let me teach you. And, and, and even more, because this man he needed more than a teacher. He needed all that Jesus is. He needed a master, one to give allegiance to, and he needed a savior." If this man would have stuck around, if he would have followed Jesus, he would have heard what Jesus is about to teach in, in, in 1045, that, that Jesus came to give himself, to give his life a ransom for many, to pay for sin, to be the Savior that we all need because we all fall short. But this man didn't understand how much of a sinner he was and how much he needed a Savior like many today. You think about some of the evangelisms, and many today can offer a Christianity that doesn't tell people to give up their ultimate God. Just add some Jesus teaching on the side. You can feel better about yourselves. Feel like you're going to heaven. There needs to be a challenge to repentance. And it's ongoing. We can't let people deceive to thinking they can cling to their idols and still have God. We can't forget repentance. We need to know that we're sinners. We need to know that we need to give our allegiance, our faith. And it doesn't mean I necessarily need to bring that out, but we can't see the beauty of Christ and have something else look more beautiful. They need to be convinced by the work of the Spirit that they are helpless and needy. And God is the answer. Christ has come to be that answer. Practically, can't that be such a hard thing to do when you're talking to someone, to, to, to bring them to understand the depth of their sin? But you know what? Look at Jesus' response back in verse 21. Looking at him, Jesus loved him. And in loving him is how he challenged him. He's calling him to repentance. and He's compassionate in doing so. He's not trying to spare his feelings or avoid offending him. He's speaking the truth in love. Isn't that what we're called to do? Again, it's like a good doctor when he prescribes what would bring health, whether it's nasty medicine or radical surgery. That's what's needed. 
And we need to understand Jesus' confrontation of this man expresses what true love is. And at the same time, while he's confronting him on his sin, he's not just giving him a directive, he's giving him a, an invitation, an invitation to life. And, and maybe you want to mark this as a side point here, that, that, that salvation is a treasure. Look at verse 21. If you do this, you will have treasure in heaven. The, the eternal life that the man asks about, it's associated with treasures. And Jesus' disciples, they, they wonder about that too. Look down at verse, verse 28. They're basically saying, hey, we've given up everything and followed you. We, we've done just what you've asked this rich guy to do. We've left our boats. We've left our families. We're on the road with you. And Jesus promises that there's something at the end of a, of a right sacrifice. Look what he says in verse 29. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, there, there's no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields. And, and here's the, the right sacrifice, the right motive for my sake and for the gospel's sake. Right? Not, not just to be poor. Asceticism, you can just be, be just as far from God by, by being devoid of all your things and thinking you're so much better and you're making yourself first by how much you've given away. But for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but he will receive, what, a hundred times as much. There's an investment. A hundred as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, what the man asked for, eternal life. Now, admittedly, the, the disciples might be thinking somewhat materialistically like they have been along and like, okay, Jesus is bringing in the kingdom, we're going to get good seats. But, but Jesus still deals with them so gently and he assures them there really is a compensation, a reward both now and in the future. And, and you're going to get a, 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 a hundred houses and a hundred mothers. Now, we know he's not speaking literally because we only get born out of one mother, right? He's not sending us back through. We're not really going to have a hundred literal mothers here. But he's saying that those who forsake family will become part of a great family. It's not based on just biology, but it's based on faith. We'll we'll share with others. We'll we'll care for others. In this age, those who become homeless, they're going to have a home among those brethren who will receive them. And and we need each other because there might be a cost because it says that this stuff will come with persecutions. And it might make us homeless. might make us have to leave our families. But he's not leaving us alone. Jesus' main point in these verses to his disciples is that we're, we're not to think of discipleship just in terms of costs and sacrifices, but also rewards and treasures. So often we hear the call to discipleship and say, I gotta deny myself, but we miss the part that it's to save myself. We focus on what a drudgery it seems like instead of what we get in return is so much more value. And we need to remember that in our evangelism. Goals of evangelism isn't just to point out sin, right? The goal is to connect people to Jesus. We're not to think of being the bride of Christ, as losing singleness. But we're to think of it as joy of being joined to him. And so when we give the gospel, gospel means good news, right? I've seen so many presentations, and there's no good news in the good news. You need to get to the fountain, not just to to how short you fall. The good news is about what God has done. The bad news is about how short we fall. And our, our gospel presentations can sometimes just be about how bad we are. That's not the gospel. The gospel is a proclamation of what God has done in Christ so that wretched sinners can be made holy, changed such that we would surrender all. But the rich young ruler didn't grasp real treasure because he was deceived by the worldly treasure that he had in front of him. It blinded him. His First worldly status, or at least, maybe not first, but pretty close to the top, it's going to make them last in the end, like verse 31. But those who become humble and don't look to be first, they're going to be honored. They're going to be honored in heaven. 
So that's a side point. Salvation is a treasure, and we need to have that focus. But, but moving on here, salvation requires repentance was our first point. But second here, salvation is impossible on our own. So okay, we, we said that not everyone maybe has to sell their possessions. The, the real issue is having to substitute God. But, but Jesus just doesn't let it go. He presses it further. He turns to his disciples and he says in verse 23, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. Now, now Jesus here, he's no longer just talking about this one particular man, is he? He's extending it to those who are rich. And the disciples are amazed because for the most part, in, in the Judaism of his day, wealth is seen as God's favor and blessing. And, and Jesus, we see this repeatedly in the Gospels. What he usually talks about, riches, is more of a barrier than a blessing, isn't it? And, and, and Jesus is, is still turning the disciples' views upside down of the kingdom. And he repeats it again in verse 24. He says, children, and here's affectionately, and, and maybe a little bit of comfort, like, no, you are my followers here. He says, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? And then he gives us this vivid illustration about how hard it is to, to reinforce his point that, that those who are ruled by money can't be ruled by God. And he says, it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. you got the largest animal in Palestine going through the smallest hole that you have around. And maybe you've heard there's, there's various interpretations of this passage. I'm not going to go through it, but it's not hard. A six-year-old can understand it. In fact, I tried it out this week with a six-year-old. I said, okay, make the smallest hole you can. Make, make, make like a hole like the size of a needle. Okay, and try and stick your head through it. And they're giggling and, oh, daddy, that's silly and stuff like that. Okay, and, and what if you were to try to put a camel through it? And, and he came to a conclusion, he says, impossible. Exactly right. Impossible. It's not just an obstacle. It's an insurmountable barrier. It's not like some rich men can squeeze through the needle. None of them can. And at face value, the disciples, probably like you, maybe a little uncomfortable thinking, well, what about all the rich people in the Bible who surely must be saved? Like, what about Abraham? He was a rich man, wasn't he? And David, man after God's own heart? The disciples, they're just even more astonished, it says in verse 26, then who can be saved? It's the right question. And then Jesus gives that verse that we typically jump to right away. Well, with people it's impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Now, before we console ourselves that God can save even a rich man, we need to fold in the context here a little bit of what's going on and a little bit of what we've just learned and understand how he makes the impossible happen. Right? There's two parts here. Salvation is impossible with people. So let's talk about that first and then, and then we'll talk about how it's possible with God. But, but first of all, apart from God, no one can do anything to be saved. You heard that passage this morning that we read, right? We're dead in trespasses and sins. We can't do anything to get out. We can't add anything. We can't keep the law perfectly. We're unable. And at a heart level, we don't really want to, not in a way that pleases God. It's impossible. The Bible teaches we don't want God. We, we suppress the truth about God. And that goes for religious people like the Pharisees or the rich young ruler, as well as irreligious people, the prostitutes and the sinners that are around at that time that Jesus spent time with, because they're just going to eat, drink, and be merry. Those types, well, they just throw morals to the wind. All are separated, Paul teaches in Romans. In fact, in Romans 8, 7, he says that a mind that's in the flesh, that's set on the flesh, it's hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Unable. And Paul says, apart from God granting his Holy Spirit, that's the way everyone is. We can't submit. It's impossible. Like in another place, in Jeremiah 13, 
there's a passage that says, can a leopard change his spots? Well, if so, the passage goes on, you might be able to do what is good. But guess what? A leopard can't change his spots. You can't do what's truly good in God's eyes. What real goodness is can't happen. Can someone with some other substitute God, whether it's riches or whatever, change on his own and submit himself to the true God in repentance and faith? Well, you could if salvation was a human achievement, but it's not. And the notion that it is a human achievement is why there are so many unconverted people in churches today. You can teach that you can nod your head about a few facts about Jesus and then just do your best and and, and never actually put away your idols. Take a little bit of Jesus, enough to make you feel forgiven and go to heaven, but not too much of Jesus, not such that his glory takes full command of your life. You can think, well, 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 I give to the church, I go to the church, I, I support all sorts of charities and missions. And subtly, your religion is about more about what you have done and what you do, and not all about your dependence upon God and your need for a Savior and His ongoing grace. It's not like a child. It's one deceived by riches, or whatever your ultimate allegiance is to. Just be covering it up. So, so how do I change? What can I do? There's a dilemma here, isn't it? One needs to change and repent, but one can't. And I don't need just more information. I can't muster up the desire for God on my own. The religious leader, he was, he was looking for information. And that's, that's why we need the second part. It's possible with God. But, but we need to know how God makes it possible. How he makes it possible is what Jesus taught in John chapter 3 when another one came up to him and and called him a teacher, called him rabbi, and and knew he must be a man from God. And and Jesus gets right at him. He says, you must be born again. You must be born from above. You must be born of the water and the spirit, meaning you you need God's water to cleanse you, to sprinkle you clean. It's, It's referencing an Old Testament passage in Ezekiel 36 where he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your cleanness. There's the forgiveness of sins. From all your idols, I will cleanse you. And then the next part, what his Holy Spirit does, he says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh such that I can do good. I can have my affections inclined towards the Lord. And God makes it possible by changing us so that we can respond in repentance and faith. And he does it through his word. He changes our hearts to believe on him, to to see him as more desirable than other gods. That passage we read, it's for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this isn't your own doing. It's a gift from God. And you know what? It's not because of works, and you can't boast. God gets the glory. In, in this repentance and faith, they, they both work out in life. There's another rich man, Zacchaeus, a tax collector. And Jesus didn't say he had to, to give up everything. But, but he was changed by his encounter with Jesus. And by the end of it, he's willing to give away much of his riches. And Jesus says, today salvation has visited this house. Faith and repentance. We need to be clear. The way God works in the impossible is not by having the rich man still have his identity, still have his hope, still have his allegiance and his riches. But he changes the man's heart to be like a child in humble dependence and needy. There will be rich people in heaven but not because they clung to their idol of riches, but because God did a work in their hearts such that their riches were no longer their God. So so that's the theology. So how does that work out for for you? How does it work out for me? How does it work out when I can't do anything and God must do it first? 
It's like this. When you hear his call, you follow. You follow. When you're convicted of your sin, you ask God to do the impossible, to give you what you can't lay hold of for yourself and on your own. You give him his mercy, his forgiveness to you. And you say, have mercy on me, a sinner, like the tax collector does in the Gospels. And that's a much better way. Don't, don't make excuses. Don't, don't say I have an exit clause here. We, we do better to confess that we're struggling with unbelief than try to find loopholes that allow us to cling to our idols. So how it works out when Jesus tells us to come to him is like when he tells the lame man to get up and walk. Jesus asks the man to do what he can't. But then he enables him to do it. The man hears Jesus' voice. He hears his words, and he gets up and he walks. And so it is with salvation. Who can be saved? You can. If you hear his call today to follow him, to trust to him, to come to him in dependence and in neediness and to turn from your idols, don't, don't just walk away saddened and grieving saying, if that's what it takes, then then I'm not willing to go there, but cry out to him, Lord, have mercy. And he can enable you to follow and give you the ability to respond in repentance and in faith, to surrender all, to humble yourself before him and give yourself to him and follow. And if you've done that, it's because of God's grace. We need to be humbled by that. Because we know we didn't do it on our own. So that that should lay us low. But at the same time, we should be so exalted because what he did in bringing us to himself was to give him treasures at his right hand forevermore. He gives us himself. Father, make us humbly bow before you. Make us to forsake anything that would keep us from you. Fill us with your grace, fill us with your love and and power and ability to be pleasing to you and, and let your blessings fall upon us. For Christ's name's sake we pray. Amen.